I am so happy to be able to uh, speak to you uh, a last time in this series. And uh, for my colleagues who have come with me, Michael Albrecht and Jim Nestigan, I want to uh, give a word of our appreciation for how well you've received us. I was afraid this was going to happen, uh, that I would come to my long lost Norway and then not want to leave. So uh, here I am. But uh, I give thanks for the church here and for the pastors and uh, for all the work that's been done uh, here for us. I've met so many uh, that will be good friends, I know, um, pastors from near and far, uh, students uh, um, who have been required to read my books, which to me is the best example of the bondage of the will that you can find. Uh, and uh, so I give thanks for Stavanger and the work there. And uh, I look forward to uh, our conversations in the future. And uh, God willing, we, we will uh, meet again here. But if not here, we have a place prepared for us already. And we will have a long time to converse uh, in the days to come. Um, last night, we were listening to uh, my teacher and friend, Jim Nestigan, uh, tell us about sweet nothings. And I have talked to uh, several of you big, strong uh, Viking men uh, who thought that this was so helpful. Uh, your wives are now appreciating you much more uh, since you now have the right kind of words uh, to speak. And of course, I could, uh, since I am also a... Uh, a doctor of sweet nothings, I could also uh, help you with these uh, to tell you how to say cutie pie and cuddle bear and puff poodle uh, and uh, all of the sweet nothings that you need since you now know that language is not just describing things or giving you meanings but actually conveying the love. But uh, here I now have to switch from uh, the way you speak to your wives or husbands and now uh, talk about how Jesus Christ will come and speak sweet nothings to you and how this actually sounds. I do this now uh, with the uh, words of the title that uh, we want now to speak about Christ for us and what this means now to worship uh, what it means for us uh, to speak about an evangelical liturgy and uh, what our worship actually looks like, uh, sounds like, uh, when we now uh, have these two words from God, the law and the gospel, and we want to uh, convey how it is that we worship differently when we have a God who is not preached uh, as opposed to a God who is preached. And there, uh, there really are two kinds of worship that we want to follow. With the God who is not preached, we want to learn how to worship properly. Luther does this in The Bondage of the Will, and he says a surprising thing. He says, there is a proper way to worship the God not preached which is to learn to run away, to learn to flee from this God that is not preached. But in order to do that, you have to learn how to flee to the one who is preached. You can't run away from this God as Jonah learned unless you have a place to go. And there we have to see how it is that our worship then has these two aspects, running away from the God who is not preached and running to the God who is preached. I don't know if it's the same way for you as it was for me as a pastor. And when I talk to my students, the uh, matter of uh, the discontent with the church 
that especially many young people have is very much on our minds. And the discontent that they have is often expressed in two ways. One that says that they don't like the church because of hypocrites, who may hear this commonly. Oh, I don't like to go there because uh, the ones that are there at the church are not so holy. Uh, they are hypocrites. You know that this is an easy one to answer as Lutherans since uh, you can demonstrate rather easily and quickly that you are not a uh, holy man but a sinner. Uh, and so we gather together uh, for our worship as sinners and not as holy people. This is easy to answer. The one that is more difficult is the one that I hear more often now, and that is that I, I do not like the uh, church uh, because I do not like the God that is worshipped there, who allows evil or even produces evil. In our, uh, in, in the United States, you know, we have a whole generation now of young men in particular, though also young women, who have come back from military service and they are deeply affected by this. Um, one of my uh, students was uh, sent to Afghanistan and, and when he came back he had lost uh, his good friend uh, from a bomb right in front of him and he could never quite get over this so that he kept saying over and over again, I, I cannot worship this God who let this happen. This is the deepest part of the matter of the hidden God where a person now turns to this God and says, I, I cannot worship you when you behave this way, uh, when you allow such a thing to happen. And here what begins to uh, come out of the mouth of such a person is the question on the mind, why, O oh Lord? And you remember that this question, why, O oh Lord, keeps coming up in the Psalms. I think especially of Psalm 10 when I am talking about uh, the hidden God, which begins this way, the first verse of Psalm 10. Why do you stand far off? Why do you, do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Now, of course, this is a common complaint. And the question why, anytime we suffer, is the one that is on our conscience and mind, and we rightly bring it to God. But when we do so, it's common for us to think that what we really need here from God is an explanation as to why this evil has happened. But an explanation is far too small for what our Lord actually wants to do with this problem of evil. An explanation simply uh, gives you a description of why this happened to you. And then you are supposed to receive this explanation and uh, through your intellect you are then to say yes I understand why this happened it makes sense it's reasonable in some fashion or another this is an explanation and we normally explain things as a scientist would by seeking the cause of an effect if I could find the cause of the suffering I have then I could understand it, and then I could accept it. And so often we go no further with our words than seeking an explanation for it. So when Jim was speaking to us about the difference between words and their meanings, and words in the conveying of the love that is spoken, here now we begin to understand the difference uh, between answering the question, why did this happen, and uh, the, uh, the real issue that God wants to deal with, not give you an explanation for this evil, 
but actually bring it to an end. Actually take the burden from you and in this way now carry it himself. And when we learn that this finally is what it means to have a God uh, who is preached, then we can begin to understand how it is that we deal with this issue of uh, our own suffering or the suffering of those uh, around us and what it means to finally get a preached God. It's not enough uh, to turn to our God and think of our God as a cause of evil. This was the, re the, the very thing that Luther rejected uh, uh, from Aristotle who spoke about God as the first cause, you remember. And uh, here we have to learn that this is not nearly enough for understanding uh, and hearing what this God has to say to us. If you had a birthday and you called your mother and you thanked your mother on your birthday for being the first cause of you, your mother would not be very happy. Dear mother, I thank you for being the cause of me. This is, uh, this is not sufficient even for speaking to your mother in this particular way. This is why we do not sit down and pray to our Lord by saying, dear first cause. You don't speak this way. Here now we have to learn what it means to have the name of God and what it means for him to actually call our names and what it means for him to come and take the burden that we have and not simply give an explanation for this burden. In this way then you can start to understand also how it is that we move from worshiping an unpreached God to a preached God. Over and over in scripture this uh, movement from the unpreached God to the preached God is, uh, is put backward. Jonah, I think, is the best example of this. When you begin the book of Jonah, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. He got his preacher. But the minute he got his preached word from God, what did he do? He ran from the preached God away to one who is not preached. This led uh, for Luther to one of the great uh, uh, set of sermons, lectures on Jonah, where he really taught about what it means to have a hidden God. And if you want to know what it means to have a hidden God, you follow Jonah, who runs away from the word of God and ends up on the ship trying to escape God, down in the belly of the ship, suddenly the uh, waves begin to uh, roll uh, and uh, the question comes, which God is doing this? And Jonah ends up, you remember, in the water, finally in the belly of the fish, and there he has truly an unpreached God. And he must wait again for God to speak to him so that finally he learns what it means to be a preacher. But you, you know the book of Jonah is the great story of a preacher who just does not want to do this. <laughs> and even when he goes back to Nineveh, his enemies, and he preaches the sermon, he now uh, uh, gives them this word, uh, repent or you die. And then he sits on the top of the hill and he looks down and he wishes that this uh, judgment would be made. And when suddenly the whole city hears the word of God and repents, he's angry about this and uh, does not want the preached God and the word of God to actually lift the suffering away from all of these people. And so there he sits, you remember, in the middle of the sun complaining uh, that it is too hot and that God does not follow through with his promises. And so that most lovely of words in the, uh, in the story of Jonah, uh, God appointed a worm to crawl up into the gourd that was giving him shelter from the sun and cut off the gourd. 
and then to speak to Jonah again in such a way that Jonah hears God is, am I not right to speak to these people in the way I want to speak? That is, not through judgment, but through mercy. Since we have so many in the city of Nineveh, and they also have plenty of cows. And any place that has plenty of cows, of course, for God, is worth saving. Now, uh, when we have a, a God who comes to us in a, uh, in, in a word, we first back away from it and don't want this. Even in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, the worship of God took place in this way, in what we call the two trees in the Garden of Eden. So you remember in the garden, there is not one tree, but there are two trees. When Luther again comes to uh, preach on this matter in his Genesis uh, sermons or lectures, there he makes a point of how it is that God is teaching Adam and Eve how to worship properly. And he does this now by giving two trees, not one. The first tree is the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the second tree is the tree of life. In the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God puts a curse so that you will not find him there. He does not want you to find him in this tree. Instead, he wants Adam and Eve to find him in the tree of life. And in the tree of life, he puts a promise. So, Luther says, Imagine this, Adam and Eve worship every day by getting up in the morning. And the first thing they do is go over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, look at it and say, there's no word here for me. And then they run from it as quickly as they can. But in order to run from it, they must have a place they can go. And the place they go now is to the tree uh, of life. That tree of life, Luther says, uh, now is going to be where God wants to be found. And there you go up to the tree as Adam and Eve would. And then you pick the branches from the tree. And you rub some of the sap on your hands and you put it on your face. And Luther says, every day when they would do this, it would take away their wrinkles. <laughs> we call this Botox in a tree. <laughs> so that now... Uh, the worship of God is in such a way that they come to the tree now and apply it to themselves and in this way receive all of the loving attention of their Lord and receive the life that they need from day to day. We have a tree uh, in the United States, I don't know if it is the same here, called an arbor vita, the tree of life. Uh, it is a little uh, evergreen that grows up as a pillar and I have filled my backyard with this so that in the morning I can go back and get some of the sap and take away any wrinkles, see. <laughs> but here, you know the rest of the story uh, for Adam and Eve. They, they prefer finally to go to the tree where God is silent rather than the one where he is speaking. And in this way, now we begin the trouble that we have with our worship. When Luther was near the end of his uh, life and he was preaching some of his final sermons, he was invited to come to the city of Torgau in Germany, 1544. And there he gave a famous sermon at the opening of the new church in Torgau. At least in Germany, this was the first new church built since the start of the Reformation. We would call it a mission start. And uh, when they were just beginning this new church, they decided to call old Luther uh, to come and preach. And uh, they had no idea how they should install a new church. How do you do this when you're an evangelical? They knew how to do it now uh, in the old way. Uh, in the Catholic way, that is, you used what was called the aspergillum uh, and the censer. The aspergillum was the branch where you would put it in the water of uh, baptism and then you would sprinkle it to make something holy. 
so with the censer, you would come and with its smoke, uh, you would make the place holy. And so when Luther came to preach, he referred to this, the aspergillum and the censer. He said, what, what do we do now that we uh, uh, preach the gospel? And how is it that we will worship in this place? What will make something holy? Not the aspergillum and the censer, but there is only one thing that should happen in this place, in this church. God should speak, and you will hear. This is our evangelical worship. God will speak, and you will hear. People everywhere are carrying great burdens and suffering, more than you will ever know. They need a place to go, not just to talk about their troubles, but to actually hear their Lord speak to them. Not just words that come from the past, but words that are given right here and now in the present so that they know precisely what it is that their Lord thinks of them. This is what we mean by evangelical worship. Nothing happens in this place than that God speaks and we hear. And Luther then says, this is all of worship, preaching and the hearing of this word, which now comes in the form of a response. And we say, Amen. So the preaching is quite simple. The preaching now comes to three words. It is, I forgive you, which is none other than your Lord speaking to you. And when you hear this, you respond in the only way a person who hears can respond. You say, Amen, which is the basic form of our prayer. And you remember what Amen means, since you have all worked through the small catechism from Luther, where he gives us that beautiful description of Amen. Amen now means, yes, it shall be so. Yes, it is certain. This is the word that you speak to me, and I receive it. I once knew a little girl with Down syndrome who had a difficult time speaking. But she learned how to say Amen. So that in our church, whenever the end of the Lord's Supper came, she would shout out, Amen. And at the end of the sermon, she would sound out, Amen so that everybody in the congregation waited for the little girl with Down syndrome to say the Amen. And when the pastor preached too long, she would occasionally stand up in the middle and say Amen. <laughs> and there it was, the end of the sermon. See, there, there's, no, there is nothing else that happens in this place than that God speaks to us and we say the Amen. And in this way, we learn in our evangelical worship to get what we call the direction right. Since otherwise, worship is always thought about in the form of a sacrifice that we make, which is from us down below to God up above, in the hope that somehow God will be pleased with our sacrifice. But here now, in our evangelical worship, we get the direction right. It is not from us up to God, but it is from God to us. Here it is that God is coming down to us so that he can speak to us here as we are, as creatures. And so that direction is none other than the direction of the incarnation, which is not from below to above, but from heaven on high to earth below. And in this way now we learn how it is that our Lord comes to us, uh, speaks to us, and wants to say this great word to us, I forgive you. When Luther turns uh, now and uh, 
teaches us how it is that we should preach and how we should say the Amen. Uh, he gives us a lovely description of the preached Word of God and what it means to be a preacher in his small called articles. The third part, the fourth chapter, which is about grace. And there, Luther says, when our Lord speaks to us, he is extravagantly rich in his grace. The little word, I forgive you, is not a narrow and small matter. It, it is a great and extravagant matter. And our Lord finds ways to give this word to us in a variety of ways. And there he says the extravagant generousness of God, the rich grace of God comes to us in more than one way. But it is always the same word in the end. It comes to us in the preaching of our pastor on a Sunday or another day of the week. It comes to us in baptism. It comes to us in the Lord's Supper. It comes to us, he says, in the office of the keys. And it comes to us also in what we call the mutual conversation and consolation of Christians. Here we learn to speak to one another, not only in everyday language, but now in the words of forgiveness itself. So that we learn that it is not only the ordained pastor's job to do the forgiveness, but we actually learn how it is that we who have become royal priests learn how to forgive one another day in and day out. And in this way we learn what it means for Christ to come and bear our burdens, take our burdens from us. And here we learn the great consolation of Christ, which he taught uh, especially uh, in the 20th chapter of John, where here we uh, hear one of the great ways in which the office of the keys is given to us. You remember that the resurrected Jesus in the 20th chapter of John uh, has now come from the tomb. The tomb is empty. Uh, Mary and Peter and John have gone out to the tomb and when they see that the tomb is empty, they are not, uh, contrary to my good Calvinist friends, they are not happy about finding that the tomb is empty. This is not good news to them. They go out to the tomb, they find it empty, they do not say, oh my Lord and my God, this means the resurrection and the resurrection has got to be good news. No, Peter in particular goes out uh, to the tomb, looks in the tomb and finds it empty and he's not happy about this. Oh no, he says to himself, my Lord is out and running and uh, he may be out to get me. <laughs> He knows what I did just the other night. And he knows what sort of sinner I actually am. What am I to do now with a Lord who is running free out there? We call this a free range Jesus Christ. Who is no longer in the barn. And nobody can keep him in this little hole or place any longer. And my goodness, what are we going to do with a Jesus Christ who is out running free? He may come and get us. And now, of course, what should we do? Let's go into an upper room and hide ourselves. And in order to protect ourselves from a free-running Christ, let us bar the door and make sure he cannot get through to us. <laughs> Jesus Christ is not going to be stopped in this way. This is what we mean by predestination. He has a destination that he knows ahead of time and he's going to get to you one way or another. And when he finds the barred door, the locked door, he does not stop him, he goes right through. And there he finds his quivering, frightened disciples who are afraid of nothing more in life than Jesus Christ himself. And then when he opens his mouth, they hear what he has to say. Peace be unto you. 
<laughs> now he comes with his word of forgiveness. And when he comes with his word of forgiveness, all now is made new. What can you say when you're Peter and you hear your Lord come through the door and tell you, peace be with you? Well, all you could say then is, Amen. Let it be so. This now is what we hear from our Lord in Christ. And then he proceeds to do something even more dramatic. He now turns to them and breathes on them. As our Lord breathed on the dirt at the beginning to create Adam. And he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. And then he says to them, Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We call this the keys. And the keys, of course, mean that you have the keys to open a door. And the keys to open the door are nothing other than uh, the things that Christ wants you to use to open a door that otherwise is locked. And the door that is locked is that wherever you go in this life, you are going to find people who are hiding behind a locked door, afraid. And they are bearing a large burden, which they themselves cannot hold for much longer. And they are waiting for a preacher to arrive who will actually now use the key to open their door and let them go free. It's very difficult for people to understand whether you are an ordained pastor or whether you are a baptized royal priest that Jesus Christ has now given you the very keys to heaven itself and he now uh, gives you the authority and the freedom to use this I have to spend time over and over with my students who are pre preparing to be an ordained pastor to make sure they're not doing something else when they go out and preach. But they do this very thing. And when they do this thing, as our Lord has asked us to do, they are doing everything that our Christ wants them to do. The rest of the world will want you to do many other things, but this is the thing that our Christ wants. And in the ordained priesthood, I, I emphasize this over and over again so that my students know that when they go off uh, to their first call, they always write back to me and they tell me the stories about what they find uh, in people who were waiting to hear this word of forgiveness. I recently had a student uh, who went up to a northern Minnesota town uh, and uh, uh, there had a church that was uh, uh, near the Indian Reservation, the Native American Reservation. And he said that uh, uh, on the first day that he arrived, he went into the church building, and there was a woman over 90 years of age, bent over, holding uh, the broom. And she announced to him that she was the janitor of the church. Well, he thought, this is not going to be good if I have a 90-year-old woman as the janitor. And uh, she began talking to him uh, about how it was that though she was so old, she remained the janitor. And uh, she began to tell him a story. And the story went like this. Um, her uh, father had come from Norway with her as a young child and moved her from a beautiful farm uh, to this little place in northern Minnesota. She didn't want to go and she was greatly frustrated by this. And when she uh, came to live in this uh, northern Minnesota town, she was despondent and uh, depressed and her father kept asking her what he could do to try to make things better so that she wasn't so homesick. And she said that she would like one thing and one thing only for her old piano to, to come to her from Norway. And so without her knowing, her father made arrangements to do just this. 
and sent for her piano, which came on the train in a large box. And when it arrived uh, one day, he took her down to the train. Uh, the, uh, the, the box was opened there, and there she saw her piano. The piano had to get from the railroad to the uh, new uh, uh, cabin that they lived in. And the father had to do this all by himself and lift this uh, piano uh, onto, uh, onto the cart. And in doing so, uh, he hurt his back. And he hurt his back uh, so badly that he could no longer uh, work and function as he normally would. And she said from that day forward, every time she sat down to the piano, she remembered what had happened to her father. And she bore this every day of her life, even well after her father had died. So, she says, I stay here in the church and I wait. Now, my student said, aha, old Dr. Paulson told me that when I, when I got here, I would hear stories like this. And when I heard a story like this, I would now turn to the person and I would say what I was commanded to say. That is, I lift this burden from you. This is what this means when Christ comes and gives us the office of the keys. The I forgive you is not only for these things that you have done, but for the burdens that you bear that come from other people as well. And in this way now he turned to her and said, I lift this burden from you. And he used these wonderful words from our scripture from Christ. Come to me, you who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Your burden is heavy, my burden is light. Here now our Christ comes in such a way that he will take the burden that we cannot bear ourselves and take it upon himself. And he refuses to have you carry it any longer. This, he says, belongs to me. When I come to you now, it is as if I wed myself to you and what uh, is yours becomes mine, and what is mine becomes yours. And what is yours is this very burden that you can no longer carry. It is no longer yours, it is mine. I am the one who will take this. And when you have such a Christ who does this, then you truly now become free. So when uh, my student had said these words uh, to, to uh, the, the, this elderly janitor, she stood up and looked at him and said, I have waited all my life to hear this. Now I know why you have come. Then she handed the broom to him and said, you get your own janitor. <laughs> Well, there, it's lovely. And now Christ is breaking through uh, in all the right kinds of ways. This is what we mean by Christian evangelical worship. Our Lord knows what burdens you bear, and he knows also what it means to receive uh, a word uh, from a preacher, ordained or not ordained, in place or time, there will be many voices who will give their confession to you, and you be ready now to uh, hand over this word. Take the keys that are in your pocket and open up the door now in such a way that people can hear what it is that Christ has come for. He now says, your burden is mine, your sin is mine. I will take this. I know what to do with this. You cannot bear it and I can. And to that we say, Amen.